Hey everyone, my name is Calvin. I'm from Oracle. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I am a verification engineer, uh, which I'll explain in a minute here. And I'm here to talk about reverse engineering with TLA+, which I will also get to. So at uh, Oracle, Oracle's getting into the cloud game. Um, a bit of a latecomer, but they have some really strong, some strong work they're doing. And this started back in about 2015, and in that same year, the first TLA plus was written at, at Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Um, and Chris Newcomb, many of you will know him, uh, he works at Oracle now, and he started a verification team in 2017. I joined about a year after that. Um, this team works like an internal consultancy. Uh, so we do basically design reviews on steroids, and we do careful analysis of the service code, uh, talks, workshops, education internally, to kind of bring TLA plus to the masses, um, and sort of broadly pushing adoption of formal methods to improve software quality. Um, so, you know, fast forward to today, uh, the team, and especially myself, have done six plus years of TLA plus on real world systems. Um, we've worked with dozens of different service teams internally, found uh, hundreds of subtle bugs by writing, you know, zillions of specifications on projects big and small, um, and it, overall it's been a huge success. Uh, and today, I'm here to tell you about one particular way that we use the TLA plus tools that might be a little unconventional, or at least not widely talked about. Um, so to explain that, let me show you one good way to write software. You start with your business requirements, some need that your customers have. You come up with a design document that says what you need to build in order to meet those requirements. Uh, you write some TLA plus as sort of a blueprint uh, of your design document. Make your ideas formal. Make sure that your design is really going to fit those requirements and satisfy all of the properties you need. Take your blueprint, turn it into executable code. And then finally, once your code is running and you're gathering benchmarks, testing customer feedback, uh, circle back and to an earlier step, this is your sort of agile loop, um, and update your design document or perhaps your, your requirements um, and go through the, the cycle again. Uh, now, it turns out that a lot of software skips an important step. Um, this is incredible, yeah, right, boo. Okay, this is incredibly common and oftentimes there's good reason for this. There are some business pressures, something needs to get shipped very quickly. Um, and they skip the, the formalization step. It's just not widely used in industry. Um, and what's worse is that this loop back also sometimes gets abridged. Rather than going back and updating the design document, you know, the desire to ship something quickly means that you go back and update the executable code. Um, and so your design documents quickly sort of erode and get further and further from an accurate description of how the system actually works today. Um, so in this world, where we have skipped the TLA plus step, what can we do with the tools to improve the quality of software that was written using this maybe less than ideal methodology? Uh, one thing that you could imagine doing, of course, is going from the design documents to TLA plus retrospectively, but as I said, oftentimes the implementation diverges from these design documents and you won't get sort of a faithful description of the system by doing this. You'll get an idealized version of what it looked like four years ago when it was initially conceived. So instead, today, I'm going to tell you about an alternative approach, which is to go from the executable code to the uh, TLA plus. And depending on who you are, this is either incredibly obvious and perhaps something that you have already done, or it is sort of heretical and subversive, right? This is not how TLA plus was intended to be used. This is a design tool. Why are we going from the source code to this uh, high level model? Um, and I wanna argue that even though this workflow is totally backwards, it is also effective. And for some software systems, this is, might be something that you should consider doing. Um, it has a lot of benefits. I think some of the folks from LinkedIn even mentioned they're now working on a system that didn't have TLA plus as part of its design uh, functionality. And so you guys might end up going back to the source code and 
trying to make sure that your spec is really in line with it. And I'll talk a little bit about maybe how you can do that. So why is this an effective way to improve software, right? Why go from the source code back to TLA plus? Um, what it's gonna do is it's gonna help us quickly find incorrect assumptions, things in the source code where we assume something about an underlying system uh, or some environment like the order in which things happen, whether or not two things are atomic, what our sort of external services are doing, our environment, like the operating system, the network stack, um, assumptions about correlated failures, or specifically assumptions that failures are uncorrelated, which is often untrue. Um, it's gonna help us fill gaps not covered by testing. Uh, so things like power outages, things like drive failures, uh, things like obscure interleavings of events, these are things that are often prohibitively difficult to test for because if you simulate a power outage, how do you simulate a power outage at sort of like every possible point in execution? Uh, the TLA plus tools are gonna let us do things like that very efficiently. Um, and by construction, the specs that we end up with as a result of doing this are going to resemble the source code that they came from. Um, this is actually a, a great point because it's easier to communicate findings to the engineers who are working day to day on these systems. Um, it's easier to find practical fixes. If you find some adjustment at the specification level that fixes some bug, um, it's often easy to translate that back into a fix at the source code level. Um, and then of course, it's easier to update later. As I said, oftentimes it is the source code that is the first thing updated when the software needs to change. Um, and so you can go back to the spec and this close alignment means it's easy to update the spec in the same way. Um, and of course, yes, we still have to define correctness. You're not going to get out of step four just because you had some source code to start from. Um, but of course, uh, going from source code back to the spec isn't necessarily easy. Uh, oftentimes, you're looking at a project that has 10 to the six, so millions or tens of millions of lines of code um, for a single service. And you know, we're sort of standing in the shadow of this looming behemoth holding TLA plus and sort of wondering where to even begin tackling this, this difficult problem. Um, there are a few secret weapons that can help though. Um, and here's what they are. So the first secret weapon is that we know what we're looking for. So if we have some correctness property in mind, oftentimes most of the source code surrounding a particular action isn't really relevant to the thing that we're interested in. Um, so here's some speculative source code um, for some hypothetical service. It does some logging, it does some uh, metrics. But out of all of this stuff, this action, writer.flush, that maybe touches a disk drive or something, this is really the only part of this code that's relevant here. And I'm not saying the rest of it is unimportant. It does an important job. All, all the lines here are important. Um, it's just that this line is the one that is most likely to be relevant if we're interested in something like data loss or durability or uh, something of that nature. Um, our second secret weapon as uh, modelers is that while implementers have to worry about the order in which things happen and have to be deeply concerned with doing thing, choosing an order in which things happen, we don't have to be. TLA plus lets us write down an action like this one that flushes writes to a disk drive um, that is sort of independent of when this takes place. Um, and indeed, in practice, this kind of action, like flushing writes to a disk drive, happens at any time, right? The operating system can do it on your behalf whenever it feels like. Um, and so we don't need to worry about all of the complicated control flow that got us to that flush call. This action alone is enough to specify the behavior of that line of code. Um, so implementations will make decisions about when, specifications only really have to capture what, unless when is important. Um, and the, the last sort of secret weapon I wanna talk about is that um, at least in an organization like Oracle, where I work, I have access to the authors of the service. These people are experts in their domains. They know what's going on and I can simply ask them, hey, can you walk me through what happens if a disk drive flush fails? Um, or at least what you expect would happen in that case. Um, and they'll come back to me with some description, some sort of high level in terms of what different nodes in the system do, um, some sort of low level, here are the lines of code that you need to look at. Um, and maybe we can come up with some action that captures 
uh, what should happen in this case. So, you know, the state of the disk drive becomes arbitrary. We have no idea what it is. Um, and the, the program counter of the program needs to jump to some other point to do some sort of recovery because it's responding to this failure it got from the disk drive. Um, so this is sort of capturing this idea that we can uh, quickly catch incorrect assumptions about the environment. Here we're modeling exactly what the environment is going to do, or at least sort of over approximating what the environment can do. Um, and making sure that we can catch correlated failures because there's no restriction on when this action can take place. You could see many of these in a row. Um, and in real world systems you often do. So in order to do this kind of reverse engineering, the basic workflow looks something like this. First, you'll gather some correctness properties. What does the system need to ensure? Data durability, consistency, crash safety, this sort of thing. Um, formalize those properties and whatever variables you need to express them in TLA+. Um, and then, how do those variables change? Go to the source code. What does the source code actually do to modify those things? What does it do in response to changes in state? Um, those actions will likely require additional variables that describe internal parts of the system um, that aren't relevant for correctness maybe, but you need them in order to say how the system functions. Um, and then finally, you do some model checking with TLC. And of course, if you carry this on long enough, you, maybe you get to formal proof, um, something uh, more robust. But model checking with TLC will catch a lot of issues very quickly. And then the key feedback loop here is once you've done model checking, maybe you get an okay, and this is great, okay, but you're not, you're not quite done yet because you have to understand why it worked. Sure, the source code appears to function, appears to satisfy its contract, but really, what is it doing that's critical to ensuring that? What are the actions that are important that we really need to nail in the implementation? What are the things that we need to apply greater testing to, perhaps? Um, or, if you get an error from the model checker, you go back to the developer and ask, what prevents this behavior? Um, Leslie Lamport has this great quote, the, the best way I know to eliminate errors is to imagine that there is a curious child sitting next to us. And every time we write an assertion, the child asks why, right? So ask why. If you get an error, uh, what, what, if anything, prevents it? And maybe nothing prevents it, in which case, maybe it's a problem with your correctness property, or more likely, it's a problem in the system, something that you need to go back and fix. Um, or if something prevents it, you can go back and improve the fidelity of the specification, model the parts of the source code that are intended to prevent this behavior and see if they really do. So I wanna walk you through a, uh, an example, a recent example actually. Um, we set out to do automatic password rotation, a bunch of databases internally. Um, so sort of here's my timeline, August 23, 2023, uh, the initial design was complete. And at that time, we actually did some TLA+, plus, wrote a short specs showing that the core actions uh, were gonna be safe. Um, fast forward to January this year, uh, it's code complete, it's running, but it's actually quite different from the initial design in some important ways. Um, so there are new requirements to, re to repair these so-called special case systems, right? Sort of machines that have been sitting around for many years and are different from the norm uh, of these databases, um, and also to add some new features like some in-memory caches for certain bits of information that the rotation algorithm needs um, that don't have to be loaded immediately. You can load those in advance and then just have them ready in memory. Um, so this divergence from the initial design is actually large enough to justify going back to the source code and sort of reverse engineering what it is doing. Um, and just to give you a very, very high level intuition of how this password rotation works, um, it functions by having two accounts in the database. So you have a database on the left with these two accounts you can sign in with, um, and then a bunch of uh, applications on the right that are going to connect to the database and do some operations. So the idea is that all the clients connect using one account, and while they're doing that, using that account, doing their normal work, uh, you are free to change anything about the other account. Um, so rotate the password, uh, and then get all of that set up and ready to go, and then simply flip uh, which account the clients are using. And there's a separate store that I haven't drawn that says which account they should be using. So the clients have to pick up occasionally, okay, what's the new account that I need to be connecting with? 
and while they're using this account B, it's safe to change the password on account A without interrupting any of their activity. Um, and so you can sort of flip-flop back and forth between these accounts every couple of weeks um, to make sure that the passwords stay fresh. Um, and just to give you sort of a roadmap for this feature, what did it take to implement it? Um, there are, for this service, about four major repositories containing approximately 300,000 lines of code, only a small fraction of which are relevant to this design, but much of which you ha would have to sift through if you want to understand how this feature interacts with normal application functioning. Um, so those four repositories are sort of a common utility library, fairly small, um, an abstraction layer that sits behind, between the database and the clients, um, what we call the control plane service. Cloud people will know this word and know what it means, but for those of you who don't work in cloud computing, the control plane service does things like this that are sort of tangential to normal use. Um, so the password rotation algorithm actually lives in this component. Um, and then the data plane service, which are those client applications that actually need to connect to the database and do their work. Um, so those need to respond to password changes. And this feature touches all four of these in some way. Um, but of course, like I said, only a tiny subset of those 300,000 lines are relevant to password rotation, and a lot of the job is figuring out which of those changes are relevant, and which of the other 300,000 lines do we need to model to be confident that those changes are right. Um, so I wanna give you a few observations about this design. Um, and these are things that you can look for if you ever find yourself in the position of doing this kind of reverse engineering. So first thing, uh, sorry, the font is maybe a little bit small. Um, hopefully you all can see this. Uh, the, the exact details of the code aren't important. Don't worry about it too much. But uh, essentially, the first observation is that single-threaded doesn't mean non-concurrent. Um, so a lot of the times you'll see uh, some code and you'll ask, well, this looks buggy, right? TLC reported a failure for the model I put together for this. And the developer will say, ah, yes, but that's intended to be single-threaded. It doesn't run concurrently. Um, and they say, well, it's one thread per process ensured by a lock. And you say, well, okay, what if that process crashes and restarts? Well, okay, there's one process per host. So that restart isn't going to race with the previous invocation, right? They're separated in time. Um, well, okay, that's not quite enough either. Uh, we need one host per data center because there could be two instances of this process on different nodes, both trying to mess with the same database. And even all of these protections together still aren't quite enough. It's so tempting to treat this as a single-threaded process, but in reality, concurrency is still possible. And let me show you what that looks like. So here's your, our password rotation algorithm, intended to be a sort of single-threaded actor in the universe. Um, and the password rotation algorithm is going to start doing something. It doesn't matter what, it's a network call, it affects the database. Um, and it sort of shoots that out into the world, uh, and then crashes and restarts. Um, or maybe uh, it has to reconnect because it's TCP connection dropped. Or maybe some middleware between you and the database is doing retries on your behalf without you knowing. Doesn't matter, something happens. And now the password rotator starts doing something else. And this new action can interleave with the previous action that it already shot off. Um, and so even though this process is intended to be a very single threaded thing that does one thing at a time, it can end up doing multiple things in parallel, it's sort of out of order. Um, so every process is multi-threaded. From the perspective of modeling, this is actually very convenient. Uh, TLA plus is a language where concurrency is the default and sequential execution requires some work to model. That's why we have plus cal to help with sequential execution. But since every process is multi-threaded, this is actually less work for us, the, the formal methods people, uh, to model. The second pattern is uh, what I would call unconditional writes. Um, there are other names that you could apply to this that are, that are equally valid. But so here's some code where we first read the latest password from some secure storage site, and then try to set that password as the current password in the database. Um, this second line is the one that I'm worried about. Because the way that you would model something like this is you say, all right, this process can first read the password, and then later it can write the password uh, into the database. But that write is sort of like a bullet in flight. Once that action becomes enabled, it remains enabled 
ready to overwrite your database password with this old observed value at some point in the future. Um, there's no way to fence out this action, right? If the password rotation algorithm needs to recover from some unexpected fault, it can't stop this from resolving in the future. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. Uh, you have your password rotator. It reads the password. It has some crash or some other fault. It generates a new password and uh, sort of uploads that to the secure storage and then rereads it back again and tries to write that into the database. The problem is that this original thing it was doing at the very beginning can now sort of fly in and uh, you end up ending in a state where you, uh, your rotation workflow completed normally, um, but the password in the database is not what you expect. You essentially you know, lost connectivity because nobody has the correct password anymore. Um, and so this kind of thing, unconditional rights, are usually a source of danger and something to pay particular attention to when you're reverse engineering from the source code. Um, and one last aside here, uh, this is not a conditional right. Uh, the check and the network call are not atomic. And so if other actions take place after the check, you have a sort of time of check to time of use bug. Um, so developers often put checks like this around their code and forget uh, that there can be a, a scheduling delay here, especially if the database is under load and running slowly. Um, all right, last pattern. Reliance on timestamps. Um, this is a very common one. Uh, we'll do something like read two records out of some database and then try to compare their creation times to see which is newer. Um, this doesn't really tell you which is newer. Misconfigurations in computer clocks are not common in the data centers, but they do happen. And they can cause the creation timestamps to be off by centuries, by decades, by seconds, any one of which could cause issues. Um, and so this kind of check that relies on comparing timestamps is essentially a non-deterministic choice. Um, so when you're reading through the source code and you see anything related to timestamps, sure, modeling real time in a model checkable way is hard, but it also often isn't relevant because it turns out that there's such a loose contract around, around these timestamps. Um, so here's one way that this can bite you. Um, your storage system receives a request to create record A, and that's at, you know, hour one. Uh, your NTP daemon runs and moves time gently backwards by five seconds. This depends on the configuration of your NTP daemon, but it's possible. Um, and then you create B, and it's being created at 59 seconds and uh, change. So you're, even though B was created after A, it has an earlier creation timestamp. Um, and so from the perspective of model checking, often there's no need to model real time. Um, it usually won't be part of the safety mechanism. Okay, so how did this project end up? Uh, it took about one week of effort to sort of reverse engineer a reasonable high fidelity uh, model from the implementation. Um, that was spread across one month. Um, and we found a lot of timing assumptions, many of which are an unfortunate necessity. I talked a little bit about conditional rights. As it turns out, some underlying systems don't support conditional rights in the way that we would want. And so you actually need these timing assumptions to guarantee that after you have done something, you wait long enough before trying something else. Um, it's often tempting in implementations to sort of reduce timeouts, uh, quicken up services, shorten delays. And it, this kind of uh, revealed assumption is very important because it tells us that Part of the safety of this system are these timing constraints, and we cannot shorten them without like a lot of evidence that they're not going to be violated by some obscure system behavior. Um, there was one new bug discovered. Um, it wasn't very major. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about it. It's easy to understand because it relates to a specific check in the source code that can just be tightened up. Um, and finally, and perhaps most interestingly, um, we ended up revising the safety property for this system. Originally, the property was this invariant, safe, that essentially says that at all points in time, a new client coming into the system can get the current password and connect to the database. Because of certain design constraints, it turns out that that's not quite possible to ensure. Instead, we have to have this relaxed thing that says eventually we reach and remain in a safe state. Um, and so 
there's an implication here, it's still a strong result, but there's an implication here for operations, which is to know that shortly after allocating a new database instance, there could be a window where new clients can't connect because the passwords are out of sync. But we at least know that that situation will resolve itself the next time the password rotation algorithm runs successfully to completion. Um, and so because of this, we sort of know how to recover from this situation. We can give operators uh, instructions on how to do that. Okay, um, that's the talk. This is the high level workflow and I'll take questions. Thank you. We have, we have a question. <laughs> Can you talk to a bit about the people aspect of this, uh, talking with developers to understand the code base? Um, code base has like callback hell often and uh, it's hard to penetrate. And uh, if you are not in the um, domain, if you don't know, it, would, it could be hard to get uh, um, it could be hard to sync up with the developer and uh, also developer may not have time. So can you talk to the people aspects of the verification engineering? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a very interesting subject and I could probably give you another hour long talk about it. Um, okay, so you mentioned developer may not have time. The truth is that they're often really happy to receive this kind of help and to sit down for an hour, two hours at a time um, to walk through all of the details. Those meetings alone can often be valuable. Um, and they're, everyone is really excited to like make their systems safer and stronger and you know, fix these bugs that are causing problems. Um, so I don't usually get pushback from, from people about time. Um, it is true that it can take me as an outsider quite a while to understand new systems. For this particular one, I had an advantage because I was already familiar with this service from previous work that I had done. Um, but new ones, often there are many new concepts um, and the developers who are like deeply admired in their own uh, you know, service world um, don't have an easy time explaining all of the intricacies. Um, and so, yeah, it often does take a while for me to do some back and forth, you know, hey, I have no clue what this class is for, right? Does this relate to anything related to your feature? Um, and Actually, let's see, I think I have a bonus slide about this. Okay, so uh, just anecdotally, uh, there is a sort of tipping point where you have ingested enough information about the service to produce a rock solid specification and to understand where to look. I don't know exactly how to get to this tipping point quickly or how to know that you're there. Um, but I think 90% of it is just understanding the variables in the system. Um, it turns out that engineers are terrible at enumerating all of the variables that are relevant. It's not their fault, because a lot of these things like DNS records are sort of a given, right? It's a background noise to them. Um, it's something that they don't wanna bring into their like mental working set in their daily jobs. But DNS records might be critical to, the under to understanding like exactly why some service works the way that it does. And so there's often a lot of back and forth to get access to just what are the variables, what are the bits of state that I need to understand. I imagine that there's also a certain amount of um, education about the benefits of, of the formality as yeah, well that. For sure. Yeah. Um, and I have a, 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 you know, an advantage in this respect because TLA plus is known within Oracle Cloud. There's a lot of respect for the tools and the methodology, um, but you know, I go off and I, I write some model and I come back to the engineers and now there's sort of an education period because they have to understand what it is that they're really learning from this, uh, from this model and uh, sort of what it, what it is they're getting into, right? They have to read and understand it. I just have a quick question or hopefully quick. Um, I'm, so I'm curious about like, so for this verification team, like do, do partner teams reach out to you and ask, oh, we've got this complicated thing, or is it top down, or do you just show up unannounced and <laughs> start asking questions? It's a mix. Uh, mm -hmm. It's usually the first. Usually, um, uh, you know, there are a couple of uh, architects that I know um, and who know me, and so whenever they're seeing some interesting or worrying design, they'll send it my way. They'll say, you know, maybe you should talk to Calvin about getting some, some formal verification done for this. 
Um, but there are also, um, you know, uh, Oracle has like a, a very open sort of design review process. Um, and there's just a calendar I can go to and look at upcoming design reviews. And sometimes I'll add myself to ones that look to me to be important or, or significant in some way. Um, so it's a mix of both, but it's mostly the first one. Hey, Calvin. I'm, I'm thinking about a topic like specification mining or model inference, you know, on the more academic side. So when you're thinking about reverse engineering, those topics come to mind. And of course, those implicate runtime traces, perhaps. And I'm wondering if there's a, if there's a role for that in this kind of process. Yeah. Um, runtime traces are something that we've been thinking about, um, but haven't done yet. Um, there's, there are some, some strange sort of restrictions in the cloud that you have to be very, very careful about, right? Your trace can't like accidentally exfiltrate data from some important customer, right? The customers are like banks and governments oftentimes. Um, and so tracing in production is like a very dicey thing and tracing in uh, a more controlled test environment may not be representative. Um, so there's sort of a line to walk there and we haven't found the right the right trade-off. I have lost track of who is next. Um, I will also mention that um, we are at the point where we would go for lunch. Um, so, and, and hopefully you'll stick around so we can ask questions. Yeah, I'll be here. Okay. Um, uh, I was curious if you still view this process of going from software to spec as sort of, sort of a necessary evil just from where we're all sort of culturally at with formal methods as uh, Mark was mentioning. If this becomes more of a best practice, do you think this is still a thing that happens or as, as a recommendation or is it just a necessary evil of where we're at right now? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think, uh, I, I would lean more on the side of necessary evil. Um, it happens to be a very effective way to improve, or at least we have found it to be a very effective way to improve software um, when you know, formal methods weren't employed from the get-go. Um, I think uh, there, there's something to be said for um, perhaps automating this kind of thing in the future, right? Connecting the spec to the source code in a way so that they stay in sync. Um, and for some narrow domains, uh, we have tried automating most or all of this process. Um, and so maybe that's more sort of the future we would want to get to where there's very strong guarantees being applied to the source code that's being kept in, in sync. Um. Okay, uh, votes for ad adjourning to lunch versus continuing questions? <laughs> I, okay, I think our, our, our fearless leader has, has decreed. Um, let's thank you so much for, for that excellent talk. Um,